Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, this is Matt Housley. So the Joe Reese half of the equation is missing today. Uh, hopefully that's not too much false advertising, but we're excited to have you all here. And uh, the guest of the hour is Vishal Singh, and we're excited to hear what he has to say um, about data products. And so he's going to be talking to us today about Starburst and building out distributed data products. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you for having me uh, on the show. I'm really excited talking about data products, data in general, Starburst, and uh, what I've seen in the last two years working with Starburst. And even before Starburst, I was in a cloud uh, a company. And so uh, I've seen the trend of where data has gone. So thank you for having me uh, uh, at the show. Yeah, it's fantastic to have you here. And um, of course, we want to talk about Starburst. But as I mentioned before the show, we're also just excited to get your perspectives on the larger ideas of the data space. Um, we talked a lot about these general concepts of data sharing, of how people expect silos to be torn down, where yeah. maybe five or six years ago it was acceptable to say, OK, there's a data source across the company that I want. I can wait six months to get access to it. That's less and less acceptable these days, I feel like. Totally. Um, I, I give an example why I feel even like before uh, I joined Starburst, I was at a different startup called uh, Cloud Health uh, in Boston area, mm -hmm. uh, which was later acquired by uh, VMware. Um, so working at a startup, we basically saw like how people are playing in the cloud space and what kind of infrastructure they are using. Um, Five years ago, I, I mean, it's hard to imagine how many, how much people are putting data in cloud, how the daily yeah. movement. I have seen the tremendous growth working even that that company, how the storage in S3 blew, go, gone from nobody using it to everyone even dumping all kind of data and that led to the whole uh, lake house and data lake. And, uh, and for the last two years, uh, you know, because of COVID, everyone working remote data has, uh, you know, evolved in a volume that people do not want to even delete their data. Um, yeah. which leads to another uh, uh, issue that people want to access and share the data within the organization, across the organization, without moving the data. So the, uh, the, the compute itself and the availability of cheap storage uh, has evolved the data in a space where people want to access the data to drive their insight, even doing the small things. So, uh, And this is why we're looking into a space where the data sharing is a lot more prominent and acceptable as of today than if you look at the five, six years ago, there used to be a USB stick to share the data, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, even even in the last couple of years, so it seems like maybe 2015, 2016, the discussion was still, all right, I'm gonna store a lot of my data in Hadoop. Now yeah. granted, you know, um, EMR was out, like people were already storing data in S3, but the idea, people were skeptical, like, can you really, can it be fast enough if it's stored in S3? And at this point, uh, you know, HDFS is used for processing. Like people, yes. a lot of people use it with Spark. Uh, very few companies use it for like mass data storage, unless it's legacy. Unless it's like, oh, I'm Facebook. I have this big cluster. I'm going to use this forever because it's still working for me. If you're starting yeah. from scratch, though, you're just not going to do that anymore. Not, not at all. And and any, if you look at the landscape of the data itself, I mean, the landscape has evolved dramatically. Uh, in a way that if you have a use case, there's a company out there solving that use case, yep. this particular that use case is a company for that. So the landscape itself of data has evolved because the data use cases have changed. I mean, knowing myself uh, five years ago, uh, six years ago as a product manager, I mean, we we went we have a we have a, a old school product management where we talk to the customers, we gather the information. Now, the, the, the product management has evolved in a way that we're looking at the data itself to figure out how customers are using our product, what customers are doing. And this is not just uh, uh, limited to the product management. Every department, every organization wants to drive their growth and wants to drive their insight based on data. Data has become a commodity, has become a, a, a factor where people want to, to actually look at the insight and want to come up why we should do X over Y or why you should do Y over Z. The, the other big change that we're seeing is the rise of what I'll call data apps. And that sounds like a buzzword and it kind of is, but the idea being, I think of 
I think of Uber as being a data app because the data, yeah. the analytics dynamically are interacting in the product. Um, Google Maps, any of these products where those analytics are directly coming into the app. Now, to be fair, a lot of apps have always been data apps like banking, right? I can transfer yep. money, which is an action, or I can see my current balance. The difference now is that we're increasingly shifting toward analytics applications where I want to interact with the app, but I want to do some kind of analytics that I as a customer care about, like what cars yep. are nearby, how long am I going to have to wait, where the transactional database that backs the application is not going to be suitable to serve the analytics data. Um, another case we saw with a client is they had this, it was like an HR system. And so of course you have all this transactional activity happening as resumes come in and such, but you also need the ability to look at the analytics of the resumes coming in. And they were just massively overloading their databases trying to do this, like their Postgres and like, how do we solve this totally. problem? Totally. And then it's just like, as, as you rightly pointed out, is that the two pieces to the data itself, like where data is stored and performance. And then the the funny part is like a performance and where data is stored is is now everyone expects to be fast. Uh, if I if I look at the five years, like okay, it's, it was it was probably acceptable uh, to have a query or what in the data. Like if you wait like thirty seconds to come out, right. but if somebody is have to wait two seconds to get a look at the resume, that like this system is slow. So not yeah. just it is the experience of how you're getting access data, and then the the not just experience of the performance. But how am I looking at the data? I mean, if two users, if a technical user comes in, they might want more details than a somebody who is completely in a, a, you know, like an HR, they just want to look at the resume. They want to look at the, has the user applied in the past? How many places, uh, what are the different places have user applied? What is the LinkedIn URL? Like all the different segments completely in, the, in a way that they can do their day-to-day -day job. So the, the, even the same data could mean totally different meaning to two different folks in the same organization based on what your day-to-day -day job looks like. Yeah, that, that completely makes sense. And so for example, say I'm at a Fortune 500 company to extend the example, I might be just a hiring manager working when, in one part of the company, say I'm working in IT. Okay, I care about the five resumes that I got today. Yeah. Whereas I might also be central HR for that company and I know that it's a very tight hiring market and you're struggling to find people. And so you care about analytics for the entire company. So for every yes. you know part of HR in that company, you care about what resumes are coming in, who's leaving the company. You want like very high level analytics and you want it fast, right? You don't want this perception of slowness. Totally, totally. Uh, and then fast sometime, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, when the fast has become a buzz, not so the buzz, but like an ex, the word where people don't even ask that is your data fast. Yeah. It's just they. This is the like minimum requirement for your data has to be fast, and and then not just the data access, but the way you consume the data and get the new result. For example, I my I my a resume maybe in a hiring process. How long is it taking to have an interview uh, with a user? Uh, how long a user is actually putting their feedback into the system, uh, how long the feedback is being consumed with other resumes, and like how can we move even the hiring process fast enough? And then in the end, it's the backend systems and the data, all compiling all the data, exposing it. So a resume is one example, but this could be on the sales process, marketing leads. Uh, I mean, there's like everything has, people don't have time to wait for the processing of data itself. They just want the data so they can move the business along. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And and I think one thing we've seen lately, you were talking about like, what you know, what does it mean for it to be fast? There is some confusion in marketing materials about what fast is. And so there, there are yeah. kind of two main categories of fast as I see it. So the, the one is what you were talking about. If I have to wait 30 seconds for a query, that's extremely annoying. So yeah. like query speed, how fast is my query running? And then there's what I would call data latency. So in other words, when I'm running an analytics query, how far behind is that data? So am I really gonna see what's happening today or is it a batch process where I can only see what happened yesterday? And increasingly, you know, neither type of slowness is particularly acceptable. People want a, real time means different things for different people, but they, they certainly don't want their data to be a day out of date. Like in totally. general, no one wants their data to be a day stale. On their I t t totally completely agree uh i mean if if i mean there are multiple examples why data cannot lag behind you cannot have a yeah. stale data uh one of the examples are uh, is that 
what if a column or, or, or the, let's say, a, a data type which contains some PII information was not tagged PII yesterday, but today oh, I found yeah. it. And now the moment I actually uh, analyze this data, the curation of this data becomes a PII. How fast you can apply those settings so that it's in effect with like what kind of users can see what data, that itself is needed because otherwise you are leaking the data. These are data security issues. There's a lot more goes into that. There are use cases why you may want to do a batch process. You may want to curate the data. But if somebody wants, if, I mean, I mean, this is where I'm going to use the example of Starburst and Trino. If I'm yeah. looking for a data into Azure, I'm looking to data in AWS, and I want to write and analyze data across different clouds. Even the idea of analyzing data across different clouds, it takes days to actually get and analyze data. Which, I mean, one of the functionality, which is why I reason I, I love working at Starburst is, the one of those functionality said like you can analyze data across cloud with the sovereignty or like what with like uh, uh, data into across cloud across region within a seconds you can have access to data you can drive the insights without moving the data. Um, I mean, yes, there's the reasons why somebody wants to move the data to the local cloud because of the data uh, uh, transfer costs and whatnot. But, as, but but if there's a, there's a business meeting, you want to actually get the dashboard out. If you want to get the an analysis because you forgot to combine the data, all those can be done in a moment, in, in, a, in a way one can search and discover the data set and analyze the data for the business context they were looking for. Yeah, that's this is absolutely true. I, I think... So there are a couple of things going on behind the scenes in terms of IT leaders making decisions about multi-cloud, which has a direct impact on you guys, right? So yeah. on the one hand, many companies are saying we cannot be locked in to one vendor on cloud um, because they've gotten burned on some product in the past, right? I, I won't name names at the moment, but like they've gotten <laughs> locked in with some big vendor, can think of a big heavy, a couple of big heavy hitters where they get contractually locked in and they're, they end up spending a ton of money having the poor experience. They don't want that in the cloud. The problem with that is it is very complicated, but it's a trade-off, right? Multiple clouds, right. a lot more training involved, a lot more interop. It gets complicated, but having tools for interop makes that much, much easier. Um, the, the second type of multi-cloud we see all the time is the non-deliberate variety. And that is almost every company, almost every company ends up having some GCP because they have Google ads, right? They're advertising, they're using Google advertising products. That yeah. data naturally organically lands in BigQuery or other Google systems. Great. You can move it or you can just query it where it stands. Um, or every company seems to have AWS just because everyone uses AWS, right? So even if you standardize on Azure, you're probably gonna have some AWS floating around somewhere. And then it's like, is that going to be some silo where you can't see it yeah. across the company, or it's a big deal to move it around? Yeah, it, it, exactly. I mean, there are like there are multiple like even for like one of the use cases from my uh, previous work. I know that because we were in cloud space, even some of the companies were required to actually clone and copy the data into different regions yeah. in the cloud, just because of disaster recovery. You want to keep the clone of the data because just in case one region yeah. one cloud goes down, you still have a backup in some other place. Uh, but again, all these compliance, all these rules are doing what? They're creating silos. They are. Yeah. And, and then if you look at the, uh, uh, I was talking to one of my friends a few days ago um, in his organization, without naming where he worked at, uh, in his organization, they are literally dumping every data into Glacier. They have policy never to delete mm -hmm. a data. Yeah. And, uh, and then he, he was basically saying that all our data, my job is to just make sure that we put everything in Glacier if nobody's using it because Glacier is free to store the data, but you want to access the data out of it when you need it. That creates a whole new problem, is that how do you access the, how do you find the data when you're just dumping the data into keep it? And then how do you know what data you have dumped? So people do not want to delete it. It's the old school, uh, uh, when I had a computer, I used to like keep folders of like where my yeah. stuff are. It's the same thing is happening in the cloud at the moment. Yeah, now one one big complication, which I'm sure everyone listening is very, very aware of, is GDPR, CCPA, and like this yes. new generation of privacy regulations. And it's funny when you're talking about Glacier, 
it seems like it's still an open question about whether it's okay to keep archival copies of data. Like, do I have to go back to Glacier and delete someone's data? Or is it acceptable because it's a backup and it's not actively being used? I don't think that issue has really been worked out in the courts yet, but it makes things very, very complicated. Um, it, it's funny because just, just a few years ago, seems like yesterday because it practically was <laughs> no one worried about this stuff right it was just no. like data lakes just dump it all in there you dump it once and then you can read it whenever you want to and now all of a sudden things have gotten much yeah. much more interesting oh totally totally agree um i remember the first time when i when i started working for my company uh putting data in s3 like oh this is cheap storage just keep the data in s3 don't yeah. worry about it yeah. and, and and then uh, i mean we were not paying that much to the cloud but over the years when i when i was almost close to joining starburst uh the amount of money we were paying for the s3 storage were like probably 20 or 30x time and then we wanted to not just store the data but delete the data because our cost went up uh so it, it went from cheap storage to like oh, okay this is not cheap anymore uh so yeah. <laughs> so it, it will continue to happen. I think we'll see the same thing with the Glacier or any archival storage too, where people are storing the data, but then how do you find the data? How do you access it? Do we need this data? I mean, there might be some compliance issues there around too. Like what kind of data you can archive? Uh, who who can see the archival data? So Yeah, yeah. One thing that um that we talk about a lot in our book that is due in two weeks, which is a source of intense stress right Congrats. now. It's coming along, it's getting close Congrats. to the end. Um, anyway, what one thing, and Joe came up, coined it this way, but it's like the, the enterprisey stuff, the enterprisey stuff that was really lame is now cool again, right? So yeah. back when Hadoop came out and Google was talking about, you know, GSF, GFS and all this stuff and HDFS, next generation, no one, no one wanted to worry about schemas. No one cared about data cataloging. No one cared about, somehow we had this magical idea that you'd always be able to find the data. And then now as the space has matured, what's happened? Well, we yep. had Hive come out. It's like, oh, actually we do care about SQL. No one wants to write MapReduce jobs in Java no. C. And then later Presto came out. It's like, yeah, we want to be able to not only query with SQL, we want to be able to query a data like and query data wherever it lives. And then yep. now increasingly there's this focus on data cataloging, on lineage tracking, on, I would say even, let's call it data communication. So you can totally. go across silos, but how do you communicate what the data actually is so people can look at it and interpret it and understand what it actually means? T totally, totally agree with you. I was, last week I was at a conference, data.council, and that the problem itself of how do you even, uh, uh, in, make a data, put a context around data, make a data in a catalog in a way that the people who are not working with data set are become self-service and actually able to find and search the data. Um, because the, as you're saying that, you know, the concept of data catalog or schema, I mean, yeah. it, it was non-existent. I was mainly saying first only for enterprises, but that actually is not true just for enterprises, but even for a new company coming and trying to find their product to market fit for the product they are building. They have also, they, they have a different, they want to find a product to market fit. They want to drive their business. Accessing their data and finding the data is the minimum requirement they have because they want to move fast. They do not want to lose time into one of the teams worked on the data set and other team is working on a simple data set. So how can we actually collaborate on the data set? How can we not just collaborate on the data set itself, but how can we put some business context on the data set? How can we find the ROI of this data set? So uh, as I was saying, uh, last week I was, uh, I was at the uh, data, the console, there are a lot of companies who are trying to find and solve these uh, issues. And, 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 you know, and, and the same thing, and we have taken a different approach, even like if I'm the lead of that product at the Starburst, the creating a data product itself. Um, what we have done, and, and, and I can talk for, for this for like hours on this because I'm leading that project. But, but the, the problem we're trying to solve is that as, as somebody in a data analyst, our data consumers, they don't care where data lives. They don't care yeah. if that data is a warehouse, is in a lake, is in into NoSQL, is in the SQL, whether you're using a Trino, whether you're using other sources of Presto, they get, do I have access to my data? And do I, if I ask, go to my admin and ask, do I need access to, let's say, order information? How fast can I get access to order information? 
And then the problem goes to the administrator too. I have got 100 requests on 100 data sets. How can I easily give these accesses to the consumers who are asking for this data set? Now, they, this creates like a bottleneck, uh, which is like one person getting all the feedback, I need access, can I get access? How can I do this? And that's why the breaking the silos and democratization of data becomes really necessary where one person is not responsible for maintaining all the data, but people are responsible for finding and be completely self-service in the platform they're using to go find the data set, go request a data set, even be a power user to combine multiple data sets to create a whole new data set. Everyone is moving. I mean, people are walking. That being a data, uh, uh, writing a query, be able to consume and create new data set is just like, it's a norm in the companies just to move forward, move forward faster. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Hey, it's funny. Uh, do you know Chris Tab for chance? So Chris Tab is a friend of ours. He's been on the show a couple of times and he works for, a lead, I think it's Leading Edge IT. So he's a consultant in the data space. And on one of our shows, he coined this idea of high performance data. And he basically said high performance data isn't just like fast systems. It's fast systems plus cataloging, plus access, plus quality. It's basically the more yeah. usable and useful data is, the, the higher the performance of that data. And I think totally. that goes right to what you're saying. Yeah. And, and then like, you know, if you're collecting the data itself, like there's yeah. a lot of things happening. Like let's say if I got to get getting a data from two different vendors, every day I'm getting 10 rows in t for this data. So one day I got 100 or one day I got a yeah. one. Why that happened? I mean, even people do not just care about the data itself, but the volume of data, why is changing? Uh, why did I get more today? Why did I get less today? What happened to my system yesterday? So the, 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 the whole ecosystem of data, it has evolved so much in the last two years, I'll say. And, and the trend will continue to change over the years. I mean, I, I, I don't know how what the data space will look like in five years because I didn't know how it, what it would look like in the next one year. It's changing so fast. <laughs> I asked you that uh, prompt question before the show about what you thought about five yeah, years. That's fair. That's completely fair. <laughs> I mean, the, I mean the, the, the point is like, all I know is this, that four years ago, very less companies, or I would say that most enterprises were data-driven. Um, the the data-driven data culture was not into the mid-market SMBs um, yeah. from, from my experience. But that is changing dramatically, um, especially because over the last two years, people have learned to work remotely, to learn or talk people on Zoom, which means that most inside they're driving from the data itself. The culture has changed in a way that data will become the prime uh, uh, asset in, a, in an organization to come up with like what next the company is going to. Um, and that company could be a supply chain company, could be a retail company, could be a hospitals, could be banking, anything. But the one common aspect around these companies is the data, the driving insight and growth from looking at the data. And if, if you look at the all these companies and is that nobody has one use case. Uh, I'm gonna use Postgres or I'm gonna use MySQL or I'm gonna use Lake, or I'm gonna use a warehouse. The, every use case fits perfectly for what they are building it for. But once some, as I was talking about data analysts, when data analysts ask for driving the insight for data, data analyst doesn't go ask, can I get access to Postgres and the S3 data? They ask, can I get access to marketing data? Can I get access to finance data? Can I get access to what happens over the, the geography less in UK? The, the people ask for data for the use case, not for the where's the store. And, and, and then that's the trend, which I think we'll see over the next five years that the, the, the storage, where the data is stored will not be in a discussion, but how data is being accessed and how fast is getting accessed. That will be the key concept to driving the new data innovation. Sorry, that totally makes sense. I mean, what I've seen in organizations is getting access to systems is just this huge, complex, multi-step process, right? Yeah. So what happens, what used to happen back when we were in offices and we talked to each other is you'd walk around and you're like, hey, where is this data? Say it's um, weblog data. It has, you know, it's clickstream data. Where is this? And they're like, oh yeah, that lives in... Hadoop or something. And so then you go talk to the Hadoop team and they're like, oh yeah, we're, we mostly query that with 
Presto right now. So <laughs> it took it to get access to Presto. But then you get this response back and they're like, oh yeah, security isn't set up on Presto. So we can't really give you, you know, fine grained access. You can't have access to that. And it was, it was yeah. just like every, every data set was like pulling teeth to try to get access to anything. Totally. And so I think you need, you need two things. Like ideally you kind of have this single pane of glass, like a place where you can go and you can theoretically access anything and you need really robust security controls. So someone can just Great. put in a ticket and those security controls are very, very simple to manage and they can give you access um, not just at like the data set level, but to particular time ranges, to particular rows, particular columns. And again, security is what really facilitates the story here, what makes this possible. Totally, totally agree. I mean, that reminds me, uh, again, two years ago when I was uh, giving an interview to come and work for Starburst, um, I asked uh, uh, my, my co-founder, uh, uh, Matt Fuller, like so, why Starburst? What what is the vision behind that? And uh, and he asked me the same same question back to me. I think it was struck was struck with me uh, absolutely is the when he said like oh you don't need to have a security for every system you need a single point of access and you can you define access from one single place you can say that somebody has an ac access to the order table, which could exist in Lake. Somebody has access to the uh, uh, customer uh, data, which could be in the US uh, East region. And come, somebody can, can have access to the marketing data, which is into Postgres. You don't have to go to three different systems to define the security on the three different data sources or the location, but the one single place for all the security. And, and I was like, wait, that, Kind of, that kind of technology exists, <laughs> uh, so I, I just it, it just it, it was actually like blew my mind, and also like not just a security, but it's a dynamic security, which means that as you change the security on the data set, and as you curate and uh, uh, compose the data set in a more usable format, the moment you give or share the data with the user or department, it doesn't take. There's no lag into it. You get data access right away. Not just that, but you actually get ac access into your downstream tools. Uh, one of the things which, as we were talking about the landscape of the data, is that like people will have be using the tools they love. Uh, we the optionality in the data space is is is, is huge, uh, which is good and bad. Uh, which means I can go uh, use a free tool to query my data. I can also use uh, any uh, the BI any of the BI big players like Tableau or Power BI to query my data. I have a lot of optionality, which means that if somebody changed into data, whatever tool I'm using, I should be reflected right away, uh, how, how there's a tighter integration. So the ecosystem around, uh, as I said, like when I was talking to uh, Matt Fuller, uh, he explained the whole process, how the system works as then, and over the last two years and over a vision, we have evolved into a, a, a better ecosystem and we'll keep doing it. But that excites me a lot around where we are going with the data, uh, we need access to data. I mean, as I said, no matter where it exists. Let, let me ask you, okay, I'm going to ask a question that's a bit more open-ended and opinion-oriented because sure. this has been kind of in the air since clouds started to become really popular. And especially since other clouds besides AWS started to become really popular. And I think it has an impact on you guys too. What do you think the future of data egress charges is? So data egress, I imagine most people listening in are familiar with data egress charges, but basically the clouds make it disproportionately cheap to move data in. In other words, I move yep. data into S3. It's basically free. It's not going to cost me anything. If I want to ship S3 data to an EC2 instance in the same AWS region, super, super cheap. Super so I stayed cheap. in that walled garden, super, super cheap. But then, as soon as I want to ship it outside AWS, it gets very, very expensive quickly. What do you think is going to happen? Are we going to, is the situation going to be the same in five years or are companies going to be forced to lower those costs for competitive reasons? Um, I, I'm going to give completely my opinion. Of uh, course. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think the egress charges will disappear into more of the cash way. Uh, for example, do you have, I forgot the name of the, uh, the edge uh, uh, infrastructure where you can actually replicate the data in the different region. Oh, like and CloudFront? Access... Is that the... CloudFront, the yes. Okay. Yeah. So, and and then, uh, so what happens, like, what will happen is, like, you probably will pay some some tiering of, like, what, what do you want to actually get out of it, how much data you're moving. But I think egress charges within the same cloud will disappear. 
if it doesn't, then I think there will be a, a company who will come out and saying like, oh, you, you, no matter where you exist data, they can use us as a system. And yeah. then your e- egress charges will be completely consumed by us because we have a better system to figure out like how the data movement should work. Because people are, I mean, especially because of the, what happened over the last two years, Yeah. even my, my, my whole company, um, even the headquarters in Boston is completely uh, all over the United States. Uh, we have uh, folks in uh, Europe region. We have folks in, uh, in India. We have like, we have folks working from all across geography, which means that people want access to the data local to their region. Uh, nobody's going to be actually all the data lives in one region because again, uh, the latency issues. So data will be more geography located and uh, people want to, I mean, there are some GDPR and compliance concern how, what you cannot move the data between countries. But I think eager's cost is the old technology and either clouds or some startup will come in to actually uh, take a stab into it. Uh, how can we reduce that? Thing? Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. I mean, yeah, I suspect that kind of like you're saying, you're going to have these fabric products. In other words, that act as sure. network fabric between clouds and dramatically reduce those costs. Um, you all already have some players that are kind of competing with S3. And frankly, I mean, if you dig into their offerings, they're they're not, probably not going to outperform S3. But the advantage they offer is interop between clouds because you can ship that data anywhere. And suddenly it's a lot cheaper to do that. T- yeah. Totally. And yeah. also it's in the favor of the cloud yes. too, uh, because if you are making it harder to move the data out of you, then folks will be like, okay, I'm not going to keep all my data here because one day in order to get inside, I have to move the data out. Yep. I, otherwise, how do I get inside? How do I actually share the dashboard with my C-level XX if I cannot get the data out? Uh, and then you are stopping the innovation to the data analysts who have no control over how much data should they pull, how much data they should like not pull, because those are uh, the data transfer egress costs. So I think it's more in the favor of the cloud itself to take away the egress cost and make the data movement more fluid uh, as if you're just uh, searching for uh, on Google, uh, looking for a data, uh, some insight from a different company organization or uh, use case. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I mean, the, the thing is data egress and especially where you're still paying to go between regions within the same cloud is just very much not cloudy, right? I mean, one of the big appeals of the cloud is that where I, as even a billion dollar company, say I'm a billion dollar a year company, having data centers in multiple locations across the United States is very expensive. Whereas I can just pay AWS to say, all right, here's my main region, here's my failover. But if data is stuck in one region, that doesn't really work very well, right? So there's gotta be a better solution. And the the other really interesting thing near the beginning of the pandemic was this big Zoom cloud contract. And Oracle won the contract. And Oracle, to me, even now, is not not a big cloud player. But the big, the, supposedly a major reason that they won that is that they offered a massive discount on data egress costs. And of yeah. course, if you're a streaming video provider, that is very, very important. You're going to be shipping lots of data out of your cloud to data consumers, to people's laptops and devices. And so, yeah, I wonder, I mean, not a lot has happened since then with other cloud providers. But if Oracle keeps doing that and grows through this strategy, I think we're going to see a response at some point. Uh, to- totally. I think the egress cost yeah. uh, hampers the innovation uh, because, uh, uh, because y- you know, like if, uh, put it this way, there's a data, there's a data engineers and data analysts. Data analysts don't care about the infrastructure cost. They don't care about, they don't even know about the infrastructure cost. Uh, their job is like just trying to get the data out and give the insight, get the insight out of it. Now there's a different team infrastructure and data engineering team who are looking at what is the cost of data movement and how do I, where should I store the data? And, and those designing those things and architecting those things is first of all, slowing how, yeah. how, how fast you can give it access to data to your real consumers and customers. And it, it, it's, it's, it's more complex. You're creating more silos. I mean, you, because you're like, I have to keep the data in all, most of the U.S. East because my 80% of employees in U.S. East. Now, what happens to 20%? I mean, now, should I not hire any data analysts in those because my Debbie be egress costs? There's, there's, a, there's, a lot, there's a lot of uh, factors there which I think 
I totally believe that the egress cost is going to go away. Uh, but again, this is not my call to make. Uh, I wish right. it goes away. This is why <laughs> yeah. I believe it, it, it should go away. Yeah, this, this totally makes sense. Now, um, I, I think part of what we want to talk about today is uh, it's Starburst Galaxy, if I understand it correctly. Yes. And this is a, I mean, I think in the past, if you wanted to stay in a Presto or Trino more recently, it was a lot of work to do this, right? Like the software yeah. was all nicely packaged, but you had to deploy some instances on the cloud or in yeah. on-prem to do this. Tell us a bit about Galaxy and then I, I maybe maybe frame the issue of data egress costs within the discussion of Galaxy a bit too. Sure. Um, so the Galaxy, again, Galaxy is an idea came from our CTOs, uh, David and Martin and our founders, Justin and Matt, because you know the Trino itself is very powerful. Uh, is a powerful in a way that you can access data no matter where it exists. Um, you can you can you can have the data storage on S3. You can have data storage on Postgres. You can data have on MySQL or any warehouse. Um, they, and then, but you can combine and get the insight at the scale, which was again uh, Trino, you know, which was previously a Presto, was developed at Facebook levels so at a scale at the where you have petabytes of data. You can actually uh, join the data and get inside of it. Um, so they, they, there's a lot of power behind uh, uh, Starburst and Starburst Trino. But as a normal user, when I actually go, I think about the small company or a startup which is in a data space, they want to combine and join data. They, they want to use a technology which is a lot easier to use and they can up and running within minutes, as I said. Um, if I have to click 10 times and I have to actually learn a new technology, I probably would lose interest in that. So these small organization, they want the same power, the same uh, uh, technology like Trino, but at the same time, not have to learn a completely new language. How can I get the full power with just amazing user experience? Uh, and that came the IVR behind Galaxy. One more thing going to Galaxy was that Data will always exist in multiple places, multiple cloud. So from get-go, the vision behind Galaxy was that you should be able to manage your the compute in different region and different cloud into all single place. Because if I have to go to Azure or GCP or AWS to manage my compute, then I'm again I'm losing sight into uh, where the storage is, where the computer is, and I'm actually have to go into three different logins. Uh, which goes to not the flexibility of having access to data, but the flexibility of the compute itself. Uh, so two main ideas were built, and that drove uh, the ideas behind Galaxy, where we believe that you should always uh, keep your data in your in your uh, account or in your uh, cloud, but you draw you run the compute using the Galaxy, so we run the compute, and you can uh, connect your data sets. Uh, the great part of uh, the Galaxy is that we, first of all, there's an amazing, amazing user experience and we are just getting started. There's a lot more to come in future. Uh, but the the point is that it's a completely open-ended system. It's based on Trino. It's based on, so tomorrow, first of all, we know that our customers will love the products we have built. But at the same time, we also don't want customers to come in and vendor lock-in saying that, am I locked in with Starburst? Uh, what happens if if I'm not happy uh, uh, with the with the experience? So we we have built the whole thing on the open source Trino, which is being used by other uh, other uh, you know other uh, solutions itself. So the the complete user experience where I can literally connect to data set in the Redshift, uh, so uh, in the in the SQL Server into Azure into um, uh, into GCP uh, object storage, like within a few minutes, if, if not seconds. And I am just writing queries and getting insight. I can share, I can give the endpoints to my data analyst who can use the tools of their choice, like uh, Tableau or uh, Power BI to connect to the data sets. Uh, and all that can happen literally um, um, within five minutes. Uh, and that is the power of God. You are getting the power of Trino without even having to learn Trino. And that is the main motive uh, behind, uh, uh, you know, Galaxy. And and to your point on the egress cost, um, the way we have built is like, you know, you 
we are letting our customers know that because we have a lot of functionality, yeah. like how, which region your data exists in, what cloud, what cluster you're using. The the system has has developed in a way that one does not need to know that if if can I should I connect the US East two data source to the US West cluster. We are guiding you or the users that they cannot. We are making sure they're not making mistakes uh, in a way that they are connecting data sets from the whole different region to whole different region. Uh, uh, what is the use case behind that? So uh, we have architected in a way that uh, we are also want to make sure our customers are not making mistakes without knowing the use cases, but also flexible enough where you can actually create clusters across different uh, cloud at different regions. Yeah, I, I, you know, one thing I suspect that in conjunction with the reduction of egress costs in the future and cross regional movement costs, I think we're going to be a, see a real simplification of the whole storage model, where there's more of a notion of being able to seamlessly move data around where you could put in S3 and you really don't have to think about where it's moving. And so you guys are providing that layer to some extent right now, at least for the purposes of database queries. Totally. It, it's funny, in the last couple of years, we've seen this rise of the managed open source model. It's not completely new, right? I mean, AWS has had managed open source products out for a while now. But on the one hand, I, I feel like a lot of companies got burned a few years back on Hadoop because it was supposed to be so cheap. And then suddenly they were spending a million dollars a year on a team just to manage it, which, you know, for databases yeah. is not that much money, but it, it's not cheap, right? You're talking totally. equivalent of a traditional data warehouse at that point with those costs, and then you're paying for licensing and other things. And increasingly, unless you're a really big company where you want to do that engineering internally, you want open source for portability, but you want someone else to take care of those details where they're the experts, it's they have a control plane layer, you're not thinking about that stuff. Exactly. In, in fact, like I mean, you 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 you're spot on. Um, I mean, in just though, I mean, I mean, the system that is like as like you know, uh, before it became a PM, I was a developer in Elasticsearch, so I know how much it costs it to actually have a cluster up and running. Um, but it's just there are a lot of small things you have to worry about, like what if nobody's writing the uh, nobody's using the cluster, or what happens to the cluster? Uh, what if my queries are small? Like, do I auto scale, down scale, whatnot? Like all these thoughts have to go in and people, I mean, unless I we hire 10 people to actually manage the whole uh, right. thing behind it, I mean, that, that can be managed. Or, but people want like, can, can it be really simple enough that just charge me less or charge me when I'm writing queries? Like, how can we actually have a balance of that? I mean, if this is why even our V1, like obviously not our V1, like when the Galaxy was even launched when, in November, it still have the auto suspend mode, things like this, where if you're not writing query, the cluster will suspend itself. So you're not paying for cluster. And as soon as you write query from a Tableau or the Beaver or any BI tool connected to the cluster, it detects automatically if the query has been executed and cluster comes up. And since we, the Galaxy owns the compute, the warming up time is a lot smaller. And there's a, uh, I mean, it's like, I'm not technical enough as Dane, uh, who could probably go double down into how he had architected the whole thing. But the cluster comes in a few seconds where you're, you're not waiting long hours for queries to be queued uh, because cluster is down. So, uh, and again, like there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, and then one more thing I'll mention, this is, this is a little tangential to the galaxy, but going back to the, our uh, egress cost stuff, uh, we also have uh, a notion of, of one of a product, Stargate, uh, where you can connect, um, a cluster to cluster into the our service enterprise. Um, the reason I want to mention that because when you connect like move data across as it's like we want everyone wants to go the egress costs go down. Uh, let's say if you connect a cluster into US East region to the US West region, um, uh, then if you write a query against US East region, that's where the trainer becomes powerful. It just breaks down the query and sends the query itself to the cluster running locally where the data is stored and executes the query. And uh, when you send the results out of the query, uh, which allows the customer not pay for the complete data movement, but only pay for the results of what the query was. So we are also doing some stuff to help our customer reduce the egress costs um, by using things like, and also having connectivity across different clouds. And uh, we have came up with like a Stargate connector where we connect our clusters itself. 
Yeah, this this notion of like query push down. So in other yes. words, not shipping data, just shipping results is exactly very much in vogue. It's it can be hard to implement, but if you get it right, it does make a huge difference. Yeah. Okay, let me throw out some more open ended um, conversation <laughs> topics here. So you already said that five years from now, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen, which is completely fair. It's kind of one of these, you know, wild future speculation questions. We do love to do this stuff on the show. Um, but what about in 2022? From your perspective, what are the biggest changes happening in data in 2022? And these can be like technology changes, or frankly, given a lot of stuff going on, they can be economic changes in the data space, you know? So I'll, I'll say more on the both in a way that the the access to the data itself is not a, a privileged thing anymore. Yeah. Uh, which means that only few people have access to the data coming out of, let's say, Salesforce, or few people have access to uh, data into, uh, in a warehouse. Is the now organization does not see that it's a problem thing. People organization do want uh, everyone in the organization to have access to the, all the data. If not the data, have access to the metadata, which is so I can know the data exists. And I can know that if data exists, I can find. And if I don't have access, I can find a process. How do I get access? Because before even asking a question or even asking, can I get access? You need to know if there's something exists. So even enabling and self-service around it. So I think the 2022 and even next year, it will be all around ability to find data without having to talk or even be in completely self-service platform where I can easily find the data sources and data sets. Um, and when I say that this is not just meant for the data team, I'm also saying this is somebody in turn coming in, somebody's going to be a vendor coming in. Uh, it's the all around that. How can I easily uh, give access or how can easily enable uh, somebody completely new in the organization to be able to find the data so they can actually start working faster. Um, that is the trend which will be going. Uh, and the trend will be, as I said, like, you know, there are sales is driven by data, like how many sales coming in. Uh, marketing is driven by data. Uh, supply chain is driven by data. Um, every HR is driven by data. They all have different requirements. They may all be looking at the same set of data sets, but they have a different visibility, different even insight in analytics of like what stats they are looking based on which domain or organization they come from. And, and that will be 2022. And then one of the things uh, I know, uh, Matt, you, you and I have chatted about it. One of the things like we really believe in like data mesh functionality is like yeah. completely domain driven uh, uh, insight and domain driving, even a startup in the big organization, because you want the agile process. You want the complete independence, but the centralized visibility. Um, and so I think decentralized management with decentralized visibility is the way to go. Uh, we have seen into different in the infrastructure in the past, in the different technology in the past. We saw the as a microservices in the past. I think that's going to hit the data. Data is going to be as a code, as a microservices and self-service uh, as coming to 2022 and 2023. Yeah, and I, I mentioned earlier, so in on this cataloging theme, cataloging, lineage, we call it all yeah. the enterprise aspects of yeah. data. Um, one thing I'll say that is new is the old enterprise version of this was very centralized, command and control, yeah. right? It's like, go to a committee, committee gets together, they decide, okay, how do we fix this data problem? And then it takes so long to get anything done because you have to go through all these meetings, <laughs> approvals, and then eventually work starts, but then you find problems, it goes back to the committee. I think yeah. the new version of enterprise data is closer to what you're saying with data mesh. In other words, it's cool. distributed, like there is a data quality process and there's cataloging, but the teams can use centralized resources to do independent work rather than like Agreed. having to go through so many gatekeepers. Agreed. And then, and then there's a context loss, uh, which is when you're having a conversation about yeah. the data, out of the context, let's say if I go to a meeting uh, to ask about the access data, uh, you have to build the context. You have to come up with like why you need it, what now you yeah. need it. And, and then somebody may not even know that data exists, but reverse the process, reverse the process. And like, if I'm looking for data, before I go ask somebody, I'll go into an, a portal where I search for it. Um, and I can easily find, uh, I can look for it. Can I find the data which I'm looking for it? 
I'm in, so while am I actually trying to find something? I may discover something completely new, which I was not looking for. It. Now I'm actually building context. It, now, now by building the context, I also know that who owns the data, what team is, is, is managing what kind of data sets. So I'm actually building context and actually building right questions to even ask to that team to get access data or even ask for different access data. So it, it saves time just empowering every individual in the organization, not only brings that individual to a level that they can ask the right questions, but also saves time for the, the data engineering team or the governance team to come like why you need access data, what you're gonna do for it, because all those context building is done before you walk in a meeting or over before you actually send an email. So uh, this is why I believe the concept around the decentralization management or data mesh is going to stick uh, just because it's actually empowering individual in the organization and just breaking the silos. Yeah, it, it, the other thing that, that springs to mind as we're discussing this is that I think from a practical standpoint, self-serve data has its limits. So in other words, you probably need some minimal data skills to actually run your own queries. You yep. go look at dashboards. If you don't kind of have some baseline data skills, you're probably not going to be creating your own dashboards. However, if we think of a data catalog as having like a social element and Netflix pushed this idea, they, they had a blog yep. post several years ago about data portal, where not only do you have this discovery platform, the discovery platform is social. It has this like wiki aspect where you put in what this data is, you describe it, people can ask questions. And the ideal data catalog can serve business leaders as well as actual data practitioners because even if they don't know any SQL, even if they're from the marketing side and have never dealt with databases, they can still look around and say, hey, this data about customer return item behavior, I don't know, whatever it is, or totally. customer interest looks very interesting. Let me pass that down to my analysts and see Agreed. what they can make of it. I mean, t take it even like I'll say, like take it one step ahead. Uh, data need uh, goes beyond the even data uh, data team or data analysts yeah. to to even the uh, an individual who has whose job is not uh, working with the data. Yeah, their job is like I I just know one tool which is Excel, probably the one of the most uh, used BI tool in the world. All I know is Excel. I just want to download the data and put it in Excel. And like it, it goes beyond the concept. Like how can we actually democratize the data in a way that you are getting access to data. Uh, you get to use the tool you're gonna use and you don't have to be a data expert to get access to data. Uh, I mean, if, if I, I mean, I think that's where the system will go, where if there's a 20,000 uh, people in an organization, I truly believe that all 20,000 people will need access to data to actually drive their day-to-day -day work. Yeah, it should be a collaborative domain, even though totally. if you're not going to say I'm a product manager and for whatever reason, I'm not going to look at the data myself, but I know what's out there. I can talk to the engineers on my team and say, hey, totally. this data looks pretty interesting. Can we get hold of this? Go look in the catalog and see what's out there. Yeah. Totally. In, in fact, like I was talking to one of my friends, she's a data analyst uh, just for some work. And I asked her basic question, how do you write queries and how do you create a dashboard? And she was like, first of all, I don't write the queries. Uh, 10 people write the queries. Yeah. I start writing it, then I send it to my, uh, my colleague. Uh, he or she will actually will, uh, change it. And then I, they work on topic, put the comments, come back to me, and then I do something else. So there's a process of writing and coming up with the query or like even writing a code around that. Once that build, then you actually create a dashboard to you know any BI tool of choice. But the process, as I said, talking about like the the self service and collaboration space, as you mentioned, Matt, is going to be really critical, especially as we move into next year. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I I think we've seen this. We often hear that like the data space is several years, maybe a decade behind the software development space. And product managers and product teams have been doing this for a long time where they interact with software developers to get features delivered. And yep. I feel like we're starting to do that in data, but we're a little bit behind. We'll get there eventually. With technology tools help, you have to have the organizational leadership pieces too, but the technology tools facilitate this. To totally. I, I get, that reminds me of a talk I, uh, I was doing data at the console I went to. The talk itself was like a data as a code. Uh, you're not treating data as like, like uh, something different, but what we have done into the software engineering, we are actually bringing to data field 
which is like development, uh, requirements, uh, curation, like, you know, writing code. Then the quality itself, like, and after you actually create data, put into CICD pipeline, how do we actually check the quality of data, yeah. the quality itself? Who has access? Uh, is the data being reviewed? So you take the same software engineering practices, put in the data, and that's, if we have not caught up there because software is more advanced there, but that's that's going to actually come to data too. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And, and data brings some uh, special complications into the realm of ops because so much data comes from, first of all, outside our own silos, but second, outside yes. the walls of our own company. And so you have to be prepared for that data to change in ways that are not expected. We, we call it data entropy, like data just changes all the time. And that can happen in really? software too, right? Unexpected things yeah. can happen where your software is interacting. But as soon as you get into data, I mean, <laughs> you just you have to expect the unexpected and therefore monitor for it and be ready for changes to happen and proactively respond to those. Agreed, agreed. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm gonna give a user relationship between software engineering and the yeah. data listening talk about the outside vendors you know how many times has it happened that in a big organization two teams are working exactly same uh, code and trying to build the same feature because they were not aware that the other team is actually building the same features yes. <laughs> same thing is happening in the data space yep. people yeah. have actually acquired the same data set twice and paid for it twice because they did not know that data exists in the organization it just because I was using uh, a different technology to store the data, somebody else was to do. There's no single point of access to all my data sets. And then people will always keep on acquiring or even creating, curating a same data set twice. And time is money and money is money. So um, that, that's, and that's, I mean, as I said, like you know, in the end, all the software engineering practices will come to data space. And one of the big thing would be actually uh, how we empower people to know what exists before they start working on something. Yeah, I, I've seen the situation where you have a data, you used to have a data warehouse and you used to have Hadoop and you'd have like data pipelines going from Hadoop to the data warehouse and then you'd have other data pipelines going from the data warehouse to Hadoop. It's like, this is just unnecessary complexity if you can find a common layer that takes care of these issues for you. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. I mean, I think... Uh, we created the problems we are trying to solve now. <laughs> so it, it, it didn't exist and we created a problem. Now we're trying to solve the problem. Uh, and then this is why, you know, as I said, like a, uh, going back to Matt and Justin's vision is like having, how can we light the whole world with access to data? Like people should be able to find and access data and collaborate on it. Um, yeah, It will be amazing place where people can just find what they're looking. If they cannot find, they can actually put a social aspect around that. I'm looking for something like this and somebody who has an access can actually comment on that. More of a social aspect around data itself is the way to go. Uh, more open system, more inside, faster innovation. Um, and again, in a way that protects user privacy. And that's where agreed. a lot of these features so you have fine grained security control, plus you have overlay layers where you can mask um, sensitive data. You can make sure privacy is protected, but also get insights into what's happening with your customers. So, totally, totally yeah. agree. I mean, I have two announcements I'll make right here at the end. So to the uh, topic of data mesh, and you guys are big proponents of data mesh, which makes sense. Um, on Monday, the Monday morning data chat. So this is going to be at 8 a.m. Pacific or uh, 9 a.m. Mountain Time. We have uh, Jamak Dejani, and hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Jamak. Um, she's coming in to talk uh, to the Monday Morning Data Chat to talk about her new book on Data Mesh. Um, we're very excited for that conversation, and in some sense, it will probably be a continuation of today's conversation. Um, second thing, if you happen to be in Salt Lake City, Utah, on Thursday, we have an upcoming evening of data and drinks and food, basically. And this is going to be at Tomplin Brewery, close to downtown. Um, I will post a link in the comment section for this video so you can register if you're planning to come. You can come if you don't register, but we'd like to get a good head count for that before we uh, before Thursday comes around, just so Starburst knows what to expect. So yeah, um, if you're just anyone in the data space, want to network with other data people, uh, if you're hiring and looking for data people, this is going to be a great event for you. So there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of cool people there too. I mean, I work with some of people; they'll be there. It's going to be an amazing event. 
yeah, yeah, we're excited. And yeah, there's, I guess we're starting with the brewery tour and then they, I don't know what all is on the menu for today, but uh, very excited. <laughs> now, now I'm jealous. I should have been flying there to Utah. Yeah, 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 fly out. If you're not in Utah, fly out, just register. You can show up for the party. So as we were talking about earlier, everyone is excited to get back out and start talking to people again. Oh, so, great, great. Yeah. Or touching them, like even like seeing people in the face to face and knowing yeah. that their legs exist because I've seen the upper part, not the lower part of the body in the last two years. So <laughs> we have to start like wearing clothes again and like buying new clothes. So, yeah, I've been ignoring <laughs> that for a long time. <laughs> so. All right. Well, fantastic. Um, thanks for being here today. And uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you more in the future. And uh, this was really nice chat. Have, have a good weekend Likewise. in the meantime. Likewise, Matt, I really enjoyed it. And thank you for having me here. Uh, and again, thanks for the conversation. It was really insightful. Yeah, this was fun. And we'll, we'll have to check in in a year or two and see if any of our predictions came true or if things oh, like I know, right? be different. Yeah, it's been recorded. So I mean, egress one, I'll, I'll remember that if it happens, then I'll take the video. It's like, this is what I predicted. Yeah, yeah. People people can hold us to account and like force us to eat the MP3 <laughs> or, uh, MPEG file or something. 2025. Uh, so, <laughs> totally. all right. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Matt.